Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see everybody today, isn't it, Tim? <laughs> Tim, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Is that because you're on holiday? Yeah, and because I've got new wheels. New wheels? <laughs> Where? <laughs> That's your new wheel? <coughs> four wheels! I know! Yeah, four <laughs> wheels. How does it feel to have four wheels? The great, 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 great! And I take it because you're on school holiday. You're really excited. Duh! Yeah! And tell, tell me, Tim, what have you done on your holidays so far? I've gone zooming and zooming in my car. Well, it's a suitcase. <laughs> but wait a minute. You've zoomed around in there. Where exactly? In the house. <laughs> but you're upstairs. I know. Well, it's not broken. <laughs> it did almost go down the stairs. Well, almost. I'm very glad it's not broken. Well, Tim, we've been asked to do a reading. Oh, cool! And we have some writing on here that's <coughs> black and red. So it is! I'm going to read the red part. You're going to read the words in the black. Cool! So off we go. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. <coughs> no one can do all the God-appointed, God-revealing acts you do. If God weren't on it, in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me, unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I am pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this, you know, born again talk? Well, Jesus said, listen, you know, listen to me. You're not listening. I'm not in the candidas. <laughs> Let me say it again. No! Okay. What I'm going to explain is what's written in the Bible. Unless a person submits his original creation, the wind hovering over the water, creation, the invisible moving, the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter the kingdom of heaven. When you look at a baby, it's not just that. A body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you cannot see and touch. The spirit and becomes a living spirit. So, don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so you, too, speak. So, sorry, my bad, out of this world, so too speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it's come from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above. By the wind of God, the spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, 
Nicodemus asked. What do you mean by this? How does this happen? Good one, Tim. <coughs> Jesus said, You're a respected teacher of Israel, and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only <coughs> what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing second-hand here, no heresy. Yet instead, by facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. I t if I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face, and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you things you cannot see? The things of God. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from the presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent into the, in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe. It is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his only son, his son and only son. And this is why, so that no one can be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. You don't... <coughs> God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to pull the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind son of God who introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Oh. In Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial, illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen. For the God work, it is. I like Jesus. That's the best thing, Tim. Believe in him. I believe in him. Good. It's time for you and I to go. But I didn't tell them. It's, it's okay, Tim. Next time, you can tell them. But can I have one of those? One of what? Those. Well, one of these. <laughs> well, I've got new wheels. <laughs> Next time, we'll see. I'll have to speak to Karen, you know. Angel, will let you. If you're good. <laughs> well, apparently if you're good. I'm good already. <laughs> well, Tim, it's time for us to go. Okay, see ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Stephen, thank you Tim, and that was obviously read from the message, so um, thank you both.
today we are continuing with this theme of conversations that Jesus had. Conversations with Jesus, and we're obviously today speaking about the conversation with Nicodemus, which was so well portrayed for us there. Now, um, <clears throat> we know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He came to Jesus by night. Now, this conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus is probably one of the most significant conversations in all of the Bible. Now, why do I say that? Well, because from this conversation, there emerged two key verses, two key texts that are probably among the most preached on texts in all of the Bible. I'm talking about John 3, verse 3, and John 3, 16, which I will refer to later. Now, why did Nicodemus come by night? Well, Nicodemus held a senior position in the ruling body of the day. He sat on the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin were Pharisees, and we know that they had no time for God. We know that they were a very self-righteous people. They thought they could save themselves. They didn't need a saviour. Nicodemus probably didn't want his fellow members on the Sanhedrin to know that he was coming to Jesus. So he came by night. And when he came to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. Nobody could do the things that you're doing unless God is with him. But notice how Jesus responded. Jesus came straight to the point and he put this finger on the issue that needed dealt with in Nicodemus's life. Unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. You see, these days, so many people will argue that there are different routes up the mountainside. It doesn't matter, they say, what way you come. That's not what Jesus says. There is only one way. You must be born again. Now, here, Jesus is laying down the entry requirement for access into his father's home. Here, Jesus is laying down the qualifying criteria. No man will see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. But Nicodemus is confused. How can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? I'm a grown man, Lord. It's not physically possible. But in verse 7, Jesus emphasized the same thing, but this time he emphasized it even more strongly. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. And when Jesus says you must, then we must. When Jesus says you must, we are not in a position to argue with him. You see, if anybody ought to know how, what the entry qualification is to get into his father's kingdom, then Jesus knew because he has just left the heavenly kingdom behind. So he knows the requirement for getting into his father's kingdom. But Nicodemus still hasn't grasped it. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? How can these things be? Now, in attempting to answer that question, I'm going to spend some time looking at verse 14 and verse 16. Verse 14 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why did Jesus say that? First of all, he is telling Nicodemus the way by which he himself was going to die. The serpent was raised on a pole. Jesus, the Son of Man, would also be raised on a pole. But Jesus is saying more than that to Nicodemus. We know the account he's referring to here. It goes back to the book of Numbers. The children of Israel were wandering through the desert. They were disillusioned and discouraged. They started grumbling. 
eventually, in their grumbling, they, they sinned against God, and God lost patience with them. God allowed them to be attacked by fiery serpents, and some of them died from those snake bites. The people repented, and they went to Moses, and they asked Moses to go to God, asking for a cure from this serpent bite. God said to Moses, make a bronze serpent, raise it on a pole, and the ones who look to this, this serpent on the pole will be instantly healed. Well, we too have been bitten, bitten by the snake bite of sin. And we too have to look to the one on the pole, the one, the son of man who is raised up on the pole. And verse 15 says that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. John 3 and 16 is probably the best known verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Martin Luther called it the gospel in a nutshell. If we were to fully grasp the meaning of this one verse, then we would certainly find for ourselves the way of salvation. I just want to spend a bit of time looking at this verse. It starts with the words, For God. For God. Everything has its beginnings in God. The creation plan had its beginnings with God. The salvation plan had its beginnings with God. Your life had its beginnings with God. For God. For God spoke and he created the heavens and the earth. For God spoke and he created the earth and the, dry, the seas and the dry land. For God spoke and he created night and day. For God spoke and he created all the creatures that move on the land and all the fish that swim in the sea. For God is the altogether powerful God who created all of these things by the power of his spoken word. For God is awesome in his power. For God also saw that only he could implement the way of salvation. The first man had chosen the path of sin, and Adam's sin had been passed down the line to all of us. And God saw that only he could implement a plan of salvation that would satisfy his own anger and satisfy his hatred for sin. For God implemented the way of salvation. Your life had its beginnings with God. A few weeks ago, Robbie quoted from the conversation between Jesus and Nathaniel where Jesus said to Nathaniel, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Well, Jesus says the same to you and to me today. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I have watched you as you have gone about your daily business. There is nothing that is hidden from me. I have watched over you every day of your life, even from your childhood. Sadly, there are some who go through life feeling alone and rejected, and Karen spoke about this last week. Sadly, some are told, even in childhood, that they were unwanted. They were an accident. But you know what God says today? First of all, he says, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. But he says more than that. He says to you what he said to Jeremiah of old. When you were in your mother's womb, I saw you. Your life was not an accident. God has a plan for it and God has a purpose for it. And God has watched over you every day of life for God. For God so loved. 
God has many qualities and God has many characteristics. And I've already mentioned some of them. He's the altogether powerful God. He's the all-seeing God. He's the omnipotent God, the God who reigns, reigns and rules over the world. He's also the altogether holy God. So holy is he that even the angels in their perfection, they veil their faces in his presence crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is altogether holy. But thankfully for us today, he has another quality, for God so loved. It's not just that he loves, he so loves. God so loved the world. Now that doesn't mean that God world, that God loves the world as he created it. It doesn't mean that he loves creation, even although when it was completed, he said it was very good. God loves the world means he loves the people of this world. He loves them all equally. He loves you. You will never know just how much God loves you. God so loves the world that he gave. Loving and giving go hand in hand. When we love somebody, it is the most natural thing in the world that we will give them gifts. That is the way we show our affection for somebody. We give them gifts. But there's a difference here. When we give gifts, we only give a proportion of what we own. We give a token. That's not the way God works. God so loved the world that he gave his only. When God gave his only, meant he had none left. God only had the one son. And his faithful son, Jesus, was with him, sitting on his right hand in glory. God so loved him. He was the perfect son, the son who had never done anything wrong. But God also so loved the man he had created. But the man has by now chosen the path of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And somebody had to die in this equation. God had a choice to make. He had to choose between the son whom he so loved and the man whom he so loved. He chose to let the son die, to bring hope to the man he so loved. His son left glory, came down to earth, and he came to take upon himself your sin, your shame, your guilt, my sin, my shame, my guilt. He took it to a cross at Calvary. And there he paid the full penalty for it. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever, that whosoever, it's a remarkable word, the word whosoever. Nobody is excluded by the word whosoever. It's an all-embracing word. Whosoever. And what is it that the whosoever have to do? Whosoever believes. Now, a word of caution on this one. Some people will say, I believe in God. But you know what James says in his epistle? You believe in God. You do well. But the demons believe that too. So it's not enough for us to just believe there's a God. It's not enough for us to believe that a Savior called Jesus came into the world. You see, you can believe that purely at an intellectual level. But it has to progress from our intellect and into our hearts. How does that happen? Well, that takes us back to the question that... Nicodemus asked of Jesus, how can these things be? How can these things be? And it also takes us back to John 3 and verse 3. Unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. So how is a man born again? 
A man is born again when he is ready to die to self. When he's ready to surrender all to Jesus. When he's ready to come to Jesus praying, Lord, you take my life. You take my future. You take my plans. You take everything that I have and everything that I own. I surrender it all to you, Lord. I ask that I would be washed in the blood of Jesus. And how do we know we're born again? When that peace comes into our lives. The search for salvation goes on until we find the peace that passes all understanding. Then we know we have found salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish. Glory to his name, those who find him, they will not perish. But there's an implied negative in here too. Those who do not find him, they will perish. They will perish eternally. There's a teaching in this verse about heaven and hell. Hell is a place to be avoided at all costs. The Bible speaks of hell as a place of wailing and of gnashing of teeth, a place of eternal regret and a place of eternal torment. But Jesus says they need not perish. I have made provision for them. All of us must go through the experience of death. But for the believer, they will not go through that experience alone. For the believer, it is merely the valley of the shadow of death. And a shadow, my friend, will do you no harm. For the believer, they will be accompanied by their saviour. And ultimately, they will emerge on the other side into that glorious new Jerusalem that Jesus has prepared for his own saints. It hasn't even entered into the heart of man what he has prepared for those who love him. Who are they who are arrayed in robes of white? These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. God the Lord will wipe every tear from every eye. That is the glorious inheritance for Christ's saints. My friend, it's enough to make us homesick for heaven. What about us today? Have we found him? Have we found the way of salvation? Have we found an answer to the question that Nicodemus asked? How can these things be? Unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. If we have found him, Jesus left one last command with us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of my broken body. Do this in remembrance of my shed blood. Do this in remembrance of the cost of your salvation. If you know him, he has asked that we remember him. If you have yet to find salvation, please let these elements pass you by. There are warnings in scripture against taking them if we have yet to find salvation. But today, if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, please take the bread and wine. Take it thoughtfully. Take it prayerfully. Take it solemnly. Take it thankfully. Do this in remembrance of me. If the stewards would like to come forward, please.